Crime Scene. I am your host, Joe Hollywood. And once again, I am joined by Imagine O's Pete. I overshot the grizzly mark and went straight to Ted Kaczynski. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, everybody. Do you need to borrow my beard trimmer? <laughs> I'll need a weed whacker. <laughs> and we are joined by Andrew Jimmy Hoffa Walker. Oh, Jimmy. Oh, oh they had to go. bring up organized labor because that's the topic tonight. I That's prefer right. Andrew, go cross the line, <laughs> Walker. <laughs> Very well. There you go. So, yes, uh, we're going to have what could be our first topical podcast uh, as things are happening out there in Hollywood. Um, once again, for the first time in 16 years, Hollywood is at a standstill and is at the mercy of the writer strike. And uh, there is no end in sight. And like I said, it's the first time in 16 years that uh, there's been a major strike in Hollywood that has shut down productions. And uh, I read online that the 2007 strike uh, cost Hollywood in Los Angeles over $2 billion in lost revenue. So there's motivation to kind of get this thing over with. But as far as I know, there's no negotiations happening on either side right now. I would right think now. they'd want to get this done with, but. Yeah. Yeah. And now, you know, there are people on both sides saying, okay, just get together and end this. But it's it's fairly complicated because what what's causing this current strike, and, and I was kind of surprised to find this out that uh, apparently uh, the, the east and west branches of the Writers Guild uh, renegotiate the contract every three years. Yeah. So there's potential for a strike every three years, but for the most part, they've averted strikes uh, over the past decade or so. Uh, the WGA uh, represents over 11,000 TV and film writers. And the issue right now at the heart of this thing is streaming. Streaming has just changed everything. Yep. You know, with, with broadcast television, you could uh, write a season and at the time, there, there might have been 20 episodes or more in a season. And then when it went into syndication over summer and future reruns and things like that, um, th- these writers would earn royalties from the, the syndication. That's not the case now. That's not the case with streaming. There's no such thing as reruns in streaming. Because there's no ads. Yeah. With, with so the, the episodes, you know, sometimes they're all dumped out at the same time sometimes they're released episodically which i kind of love because i'm old school like the mandalorian or ted lasso i i agree with you on that yeah i I like watching it weekly and and waiting for the next episode and and it's a much easier way to uh avoid spoilers and i'll get in trouble with uh some i know many people in our audience and uh my friends out there but it curbs binging which uh, I am mm. anti binging. I am too. I yeah. can't. Yeah. I mean, even like take a show like Seinfeld, which I love and I watch over and over and over and over again. I could only take about two or three episodes in a row before I feel burnout. Like yes. I need to move on to something else. So people who can watch an entire season of a show in just a few days, and in some cases, days. in a night or <laughs> My two. God, you're being very. <laughs> No, Wait, you're judicious with that. You're right, Joe. And I, it's, it's the same thing for feature films. The, the av- average film, it seems like, is like, oh, going to be here minimum two and a half hours. Yeah. Yeah. That's a current um, trend. I'm not really uh, fan of. The, I, before off air, I told you guys I saw Bo is Afraid, and that movie clocks in like right at three hours. Oh. Mm. And so you're, you're asking a lot for your audience in a, in a movie theater. But also, if you put out 12 episodes and uh, all at once on streaming and, and you you say hey hey jackals you know just hey, go at it go at it go at it and then they binge it and then a month later they say oh we have to wait another eleven months before season two comes out and then it becomes a thing and yeah it it's not a it's not a a healthy way to consume but the defense and, is they will just raid that library 
Yeah. Well, that's all for all the streamers. They'll go back and watch. You know, I never saw that season four of Seinfeld. I'm going to go and binge that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's that's the other side of it. So they have they have their their vices for it. I am not a monster. Uh, <laughs> I agree with Joan. One thing I put a if I can watch Lord of the Rings, at which clocked in at four hours, then I go okay. At most, I'll watch for hour long shows. I'll go four, mm-hmm. three to four episodes at a time. Which is probably half the season. I can't sit still for that long. Yeah, you know, but, <laughs> yeah. but I'm just saying if I can do that for a three hour movie. Yeah. So, so yeah. I, 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 that's how I run that calculus in my head. And that's where I, I, I can just say, okay, now I'm done. Walk away. I don't need to go any further. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I have my like maximum threshold where I start redlining. Yeah. I'm at an age where if, if I sit down for four hours, I can't get off the couch. My legs don't function properly. And uh, so I, I can't do that. And, you know, I just saw um, a week or so ago the new Guardians of the Galaxy movie, and that uh, that clocked in at two and a half hours. And yes, at about the two hour mark, I'm like, okay, I've had just about enough. Like, come on. What's, yeah. what, what's your two sentence review of the movie? Have you seen it? Not yet, oh, but I'm okay. No with spoilers, it. but I, no, 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 I saw please, it. please. I, I'm, I'm. I would give it an eight out of ten. Eight out of ten. Um, um, not. I mean, I like the first two better. Me too. But it was it was satisfying. Yeah, I I would rank the trilogy up there among probably my top ten favorite trilogies of all time. Um, but I do think the third one was the weaker of the three. Yeah. Uh, the first one was a, a, such a pleasant surprise. Yes. Uh, the second one I enjoyed mostly because Kurt Russell is just so charismatic in everything he does. And this one, you know, it, it focused heavily on Rocket Raccoon and everything. And I enjoyed it, but... I think of the three movies, it ranked the lowest. Yeah, and it's time it's time to for all those people to move on and 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 do something different. Yeah, I know? want to know how this uh, younger audience is going to accept this because I, I, you know, and I talked you know, with Joe too. We've seen multiple. We I've had multiple Supermans. I've had multiple yes. Batman's in my life. Well, I've had multiple Doctor Who's in my life. Yeah, this younger generation keeps. I can't see anyone other than. Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man, yeah. no, or Chris Evans as Captain America. I'm like, yeah. you're gonna have to. And yeah. you, I'm sure any day now they're gonna announce who's playing Superman. Uh, yeah. J- James Gunn is is doing Superman. Yeah, so that's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be a huge, huge, no matter who it is, you know. Yeah, same thing with James Bond. James <laughs> yes. Bond is uh, there's names being thrown out for James Bond, and apparently the creators, the the Broccoli family. Uh, they ruled out Henry Cavill, who I, I would have loved. And I, I think had their argument was that, I think they said he was too young. Is that what their argument was? No, I, 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 well, I or is hopefully, he too old? Well, okay, definitely not that. But I, I hopefully <laughs> didn't say he's too young because. I think he's, what, 39? Well, yeah. I mean, the thing is, I think he has a lot of commitments because he just got done with The Witcher. Now he's doing that Warhammer thing on Amazon. Yeah. So it may, may have come down to availability because the. Bond is a pretty heavy commitment. Oh, yeah. You're... But they had a clip of him. Some uh, media people asked him, can you say the line? Like, how do you take How do you take your martinis? He goes, oh, I think I know the answer to this one. <laughs> he says, I know the right answer. I don't know how I like it, but it's shaken, not stirred. <laughs> He's like, oh, he said it. Well, I, I love the line in uh, Casino Royale when uh, when uh, Bond was asked, and he said, who gives a bleep? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, well, this is not my father's James Bond. Even yeah. though eventually they embraced the Bond history. Yeah, I, th- but. I think Daniel Craig did a great job. I think the second movie, the one that Quantum of Saw, I just call that Angry Bond. My brother and I just call it. That's just <laughs> mad. Bond was mad throughout the whole movie. That was like a default <laughs> setting. I'm like, okay, someone needs a timeout. So a, a lot of those movies can be streamed now. Yeah. Let's get back to streaming. Streaming. Um, <laughs> another issue about streaming is uh shorter seasons yep uh eight to 12 episodes for a streaming series versus like i said earlier maybe 20 or more for broadcast television um the writers are uh, trying to negotiate for um, more royalties and residuals because of this uh there's an interesting phenomenon that i have only recently learned about have you guys heard about this discussion over mini rooms yes. so apparently producers they're the villains in this scenario have um fostered the mini room which is a room that writers gather in to develop a series so it's kind of a pre-series creative process but the producers argue that these are lesser human beings lesser uh writers so they get paid practically scale and then 
when the show d- develops and moves forward, their contribution is done. Yep. And so these writers are saying, okay, that's not fair to create a series based on our input and then leave us behind as in you lurch, bring yeah. in the big guns. We yeah. would be a mini room. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I would think, okay, so these ideas eventually get turned over to a experienced script writer. Yeah. Screenwriter. Yeah. What's going through that person's head? Like, Oh, I, I just, uh, I'm, I'm reaping the fruits of some creativity of some guys that were getting paid, you know, 18 bucks an hour to, to write, you yeah. know? I mean, yeah. it, 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 uh, and they, and they also mentioned... So that's something they need to address. Yeah, they mentioned free rewrites because you're almost sometimes making free rewrites just to get the project developed. Yep. You're, you're writing the script before the series is even made, obviously. And so if Joe was the showrunner and you and I were, were writers, we'd write, we'd write some... We'd create the outline for the episodes. We'd write some of them. Joe will write about... Out of a 10-episode thing, Joe will write about five episodes and you and I would write about two. And that's it. And but then we'd never be on set. Joe, being the showrunner, gets to be on set as being being produced, gets the experience. And so now Joe's the experienced showrunner. So then Joe has another idea. Joe's gonna then be contacted by Netflix, and then Joe's gonna be contacted by Amazon, and then Joe's gonna be contacted by Netflix. Meanwhile, you and I never got the experience. We never got to climb and earn that. We can never be showrunners. It's almost right. impossible for us to advance up yeah. and expand our own writer's room. And even if it's mini, which just you it, know, and you keep trying to push and get more and more. Is, is that a, a common thing where the writers are not on set for a production? In, because in network they used to be. They, they, yeah, yeah. Because they, uh, they, I was yeah, they say, would do changes on set. Yeah, like, yeah. I was going to say if 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 I were in charge of anything, I would want my writers right there next to me. Yes. Yeah. And if, episode, if they yeah. say, "Hey, uh, we that this is going in the wrong direction." Yeah. You know, it's funny you mention that, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm tooting my own horn here, but beep, beep. I, uh, I it. was on set uh, back in 1990. I was on set for Cheers. And I, uh, we were taking a tour of Paramount Studios, and our tour group got seated in the audience section, and we got to watch the entire Cheers cast rehearse. And I'll never forget this moment where Kirstie Alley had a line, and she had everyone had their scripts in hand, and Kirstie Alley said something about, you know, I think she was talking about her ex Robin or something. And she says, uh, I have my dignity now, excuse me while I go clean the dead mice out of the gutters. And she walks off set. Everyone looked at each other, confused. The audience was looking at each other, like clean the dead mice out of the gutters. Well, I noticed in front of me was, was a whole row of writers who (laughs) came together, collaborated real quick called Christy over, gave her some changes. They did it again. And this time she said, as she exits the, the scene, uh, excuse me while I go change the blue things in the urinals. And that got a bigger laugh. And it was fascinating to watch that process, that during the rehearsal process, if a line didn't work, they could quickly turn to the writers and say, what else you got? Yes. And in an instant, somebody said, what about the blue things in the urinals? And it worked. So that and that ends up in the what episode. you're saying. When, yeah. you, when you're sitting there watching, like, I saw that getting made. Yeah, yeah. I, and so that's the line that we, was in. When you started uh, that story about her saying, I got to clean the dead mice out, I thought it was a story going to end up saying, hey, we got some scragglers uh, in the audience that we want to get out and point, <laughs> point at you. I didn't know where the story was going. <laughs> yeah, that's her non-savic no. days. <laughs> she, she was an oddball. Uh, she, not to speak ill of the dead, but um, at one point, she had to read a newspaper article about, again, her ex Robin. And she started just sort of riffing and she started getting really, really filthy. <laughs> and Ted Danson walked over to our group and sincerely looked at us and said, folks, I apologize. <laughs> and I'm laughing out loud, like, no, Ted, it's okay. But she was filthy, like in front of this group of strangers and uh, yeah, that was that was Kirstie Alley. She was a bit of an oddball, but yeah. So at that time, writers would be on set to tweak that script. So I don't know to and, and they'd be today. employed for about twenty two to twenty four weeks, like you said, because it's usually twenty episodes. If it's yeah. twenty two, then they're there for twenty four weeks, and that's you know you write, then you go on, and because remember, uh, uh, the fall season starts in September, or October. Yeah, you get that Christmas break. You come back in February, yeah. and you go all the way until. April. Do those back nine. Yeah, exactly. Do those back nine, and then you're off for the summer to yeah. do whatever projects, and then 
the showrunners get together on May and June and say, oh, I got to start thinking of season two. Yeah. Let's start coming with our episode ideas. And then we'll start writing around July, August. And then it's laying the track as got to make these episodes. And that's yeah. how it was. Have episode one premiered that last week in September, baby. <laughs> yeah. Boy, I miss that that fall. I know. Fall, like they're used to, they used to do, every network did a fall preview yep. of yeah. the upcoming shows, new and established. They still do that up a and couple years ago. And our family would gather yeah. around and, and go, what? What do you got for us? That was me, fun. Me too. When I was small and watching uh, TGIF on ABC. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. They still do that though. I think a couple of years ago when um uh, the I think the, the Good Place was still on. Mm-hmm. You'd have uh um um uh, I'm forgetting blank on her name, Kirsten. Uh, Kristen Bell. Yeah, Kristen Bell. Oh, Our yeah. own Kristen Bell. Yeah, so they'd have Local Buzzer Girl. Yeah. Local yeah. Girl Gone Good. Yeah, they'd be on. Uh, television's like, well, we hope you join us for NBC. This is what we have coming up, and yeah. yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Now, another impact that streaming is having, and this is sort of trying to have some sympathy for the producers, for the networks, is due to streaming and loss of uh, subscribers and everything, uh, Disney and Warner Brothers are laying off employees by the th- thousands i've yeah. heard that yeah. and so now here are writers trying to negotiate for better terms and, and more money while these content providers are laying off thousands and that's probably the reason for the impasse right now is how do you convince a network who's laying off thousands of people to pony up more dough for the writers? which is interesting because you uh, and some writers did this uh, i forgot which article it was if you they they would for instance they would buy a share of Netflix, they would get to sit in on the, the stock the shareholders call, all these CEOs Bob Iger Ted Sarandos of Netflix they're all saying hey listen profits are up we're doing well they they're selling a bill of goods to the shareholders right they have data to back it up, you can do that give yourself a nice payoff, that, that they all get for meeting their quota and then lay off a bunch of people and say we don't have any money to pay the writers like so so where is it coming from. Yeah. You got yeah. all the money for the sh- you're telling the shareholders our Q1, Q2 are doing great. We're looking forward to this, this, and this. I'm getting a $45 million <laughs> payoff. And it was like, okay, but you just fired half this division mm-hmm. and you're telling the writers there's nothing. So, yeah. So I, you know, on my TikTok yeah. feed, uh, I follow a couple of writers who are on the picket lines right now. And, and as they, hold the phone up and record themselves. They kind of talk about why they're doing this. And one of the things that I've heard repeatedly is that if you have any chance at hoping to become a Hollywood writer and rise among their ranks, you need to have a family who's going to put you up and give you a place to stay. Because as an entry level writer and writer in Hollywood, you do not make enough money to make ends meet. And that's one of the sticking points of this current strike is you want to be able to earn a living rate, a wage doing what you love doing. And in today's climate right now, that's impossible in the entry level. You know, once you, like you said, become a showrunner, become an established name, uh, that might be a little different, but yeah, it's, it's hard to make a living wage. And these are the people creating the content that we love and enjoy. You can't have these shows without writers. That they talk whether you make parodies of them later on on TikTok where you make fun about that episode. Well, someone had to write that episode for you to make fun of it. Exactly. Or to criticize it or, or to get views to your review site. It's just. Yeah. They always act like uh, writers have like chocolate waterfalls and morning caviar. And it's not. <laughs> no. It's like, oh, yeah. It's Mondays, not a glamorous job. It's not caviar Mondays. Yeah. It's filet mignon Wednesdays. <laughs> so in the in the wake of this strike, uh, all uh talk shows nighttime talk shows are dark right now um uh drew barrymore in support of the writers uh backed out of hosting i think it was the mtv awards okay and uh the daytime emmys just got canceled so uh the dominoes are starting to fall and that's going to you know increase the pressure to get this thing settled sag after and the dga are usually pretty good about it because yeah. their their negotiations are coming up right now i think hmm. dga first and then sag after after that yeah yeah so let's uh, talk a little bit about the history of the union and strikes in hollywood um as i was doing some research i was reading up about the screen actors guild we've all heard of sag you know yeah. to, to get any real work in in a film whether you're in hollywood or here in michigan you've got to be a sag member and 
there are certain requirements uh, that you have to do to be even eligible, uh, what they call SAG eligible. Yeah. Uh, the Screen Actors Guild was founded in 1933, and uh, a meeting between six actors, who I had never heard of, uh, led to the founding of the Guild. Uh, most of the big names at the time did not want to join the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, then Hollywood producers made an agreement um, not to bid competitively against each other for actors, therefore keeping wages low. And when, the, when the big uh, stars heard about this, guess what? They they developed yeah. an interest. In, All of a sudden, Clark Gable's <laughs> going, what? <laughs> yeah, so they said uh, three weeks after after this collusion, Three weeks after uh, after that, um, they held a meeting and membership went from 80 members to more than 4,000 members when they got word of what was happening in Hollywood. Uh, some big names that uh, got behind the union uh, was Eddie Cantor, who at the time was friends with President Roosevelt. So he had the president's ear. Yep. So he was a big ally. Uh, Humphrey Bogart, big supporter. James Cagney, Bella Lugosi, Dick Powell. Edward G. Robinson and others. Uh, it's kind of funny these actors who played, uh, you know, on-screen gang guys were liberal union supporters, which yeah, I yeah. find fascinating. Yeah. Uh, following the passage of the Na National Labor Relations Act, uh, producers agreed to negotiate with SAG beginning in 1937. Um, that act was 1935, I think. What's that? The the Labor Relations Act. I think it was around 1935. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, what's interesting is, you know, I'm a, I'm a union supporter. I believe in unions. I think they're important, especially growing up in Detroit and hearing about yeah. Henry Ford and all this stuff. Um, I think they're important. The problem is the negative connotations that they have because of the corruption and and there's there's a dark side to unions and yeah um, and you know they're they're just people who ruin it for everybody and. And something that came out of the formation of, of the Screen Actors Guild um, in October of 1947, a list of suspected communists uh, were, <laughs> were summoned to appear before the House Committee on Un-American Activities, yep. uh, which was investigating communist influence on uh, Hollywood labor unions. Uh, there's the famous Hollywood 10 who refused to cooperate and were sentenced to prison uh, for contempt. Uh, Bogey and Bacall, Danny Kaye, Gene Kelly all flew to Washington to support the Hollywood 10. The president of the Screen Actors Guild at the time, do you guys know who that was? Was that Reagan? Ronald Reagan. Reagan. Yeah. Who, uh, he, he never <laughs> named names according to the article that I read, but he was known as FBI Confidential Informant T-10. <laughs> And he was made the head of a committee uh, created by Louis B. Mayer to purge the industry of communists. Uh, the guild voted to force its members to take a non-communist pledge. This is the union who's supposed to be behind you is forcing its members to take a non-communist pledge. Uh, hundreds of people were prevented from working in the industry during this time, uh, which is now known as McCarthyism. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the Screenwriters Guild gave the studios permission uh, to delete any names who failed to clear their name before Congress. So if you were suspected of being a communist suspected, with, not with even, no evidence, yeah. if you didn't go before a Congress to clear your name, your union, your Writers Guild, was letting the movie studios, the producers, remove your name from your work. Your brothers and sisters. And that's why people are kind of leery about unions. They're supposed to have your back, sure. but they were giving in to these uh, these bullies. The Red Scare, because, I mean, that's the good way to, if you want to break all the unions, like we were just talking about the WGA and DGA all supporting each other, just once the communism... You throw the C word around, <laughs> and back then, all of a sudden, this, and it was the Screen Actors Guild that said, oh, then we're crossing the picket line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all it yeah. took. Yeah. Unions to turn on unions. Now, um, SAG uh, avoided some early strikes. They There were times where it came down to the last minute, 
and they avoided strikes. But then in 1960, the very first Screen Actors Guild uh, strike took place against seven major studios. Uh, it was the first industry-wide strike uh, since uh, films were invented. Um, the WGA went on strike in 1960 for similar reasons. Uh, and the demand was 6 or 7% of the gross earnings of the pictures made since 1948 and were sold to television. So just like streaming is kind of this new phenomenon, back then television was this new phenomenon. Yeah. And the writers and the actors wanted a piece of the action and had to fight for it. And, man, they weren't going to give anything up until it came down to shutting down productions. And, and like you said, how television was a new medium. medium. And the 27, or 2007, the, they were trying, a big part of the negotiation was DVD sales. Yeah. yeah. Today, <laughs> and, and, and that's not and, a thing. And the potential emerging internet at right. the time. Yeah. And imagine someone predicting correctly in 2007 how huge Netflix and Amazon and the streamers yeah. would be. Yeah. Man. Well, they knew internet might was going to be a big chunk. They didn't know what. But would they come didn't know of streaming how. would come of internet. Yeah. Yeah. But man, just fascinating how how much has changed in the 15 years. But like Joe said, it, it, it's predict. human nature too. At some point, you know, you just have to pick off the leaders. Mm -hmm. And someone's going to sign a deal that, and then says, "Hey guys, we couldn't get everything we wanted, but then the devil's in the details, mm -hmm. and that's and that that's where you get upset. Where the average union member is going, "Hey, aren't you supposed to be looking out for me? Right. Not only am I getting my back in the red scare, I'm getting my name stra scratched off stuff, but now you signed a deal. You, I thought you, what happened to checking in with us? It's like, yeah, guys, this is the best deal we're going to get. Trust me on this. Why are you wearing a fur coat? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you know, and and." Not that Kirk Douglas was like, you know, right. this, had this flawless record, but because of him and, and Spartacus and giving uh, Dalton Trumbo credit on the film and everything, that st started sending things in the right direction. Yeah. But um, it took rebels like that to, uh, to make a stand. And it's so shocking to think that at that time, the union didn't have your back. Oh, it, it helped that. Murrow on the outside with journalism was because you know McCarthy was aiming at everybody, so it helped that Murrow was having that fight outside, cost you know cost Murrow but took down McCarthy. Yeah, now um, why are unions necessary? Well, without them, workers face deplorable conditions, unfair, uneven uh, compensation practices. I was reading up on the 1941 Disney animator strike. There you go. And basically those who decided to strike said that um, some writers were being paid a whopping $300 per week. This is in 1941 dollars, while other employees were making $12 per week. And it was arbitrary. It was on Disney's whim that those who had earned their keep would get paid this and other people would get paid poverty wages. And they were getting sick of it. And so they decide to go up against Walt Disney. Uh, they shut down production at Disney for four months. And what did, how did Disney respond? He fired those people who went on strike. Uh, eventually, and I'm just kind of summing things up here, but eventually he was forced to negotiate with the Screen Cartoonist Guild. And they... they agreed on a contract, and as a condition of the contract, Disney was forced to rehire uh, those who wanted to come back and work for Disney. I could imagine what the the working environment must have been yeah. like for people who came walking back into that office. Um, and, uh, again, prior to the negotiation of the contract, uh, animators were told or to... If someone asked, well, how many hours do you work over there at Disney? They were forced to tell people, oh, I work 40 hours a week. When in reality, yeah. they were putting in 60, 80 hours a week animating these Disney films. Uh, oh, and here's a, a crazy demand that these animators wanted. Uh, they wanted on-screen credit. Monsters. Because Disney was promoting himself as the creator of these films his name was on the films, but these animators were nowhere to be found in the credits of these films. So that was another uh, condition of, of the contract was just give us credit. Like, why is that too much to ask? That's so frustrating. There's nothing sacred to these writers. I mean, now, what are they going to want? The firstborn? 
I mean, by, <laughs> by the way, that's being sarcastic. Slippery slope. That's yeah. uh, what they do. I remember in that uh, wiki article about the strike, Disney himself was quoted as saying, well, we cleaned the house at our studio and got rid of, quote, the chip on the shoulder boys and the world owes me a living lads. Mm. So that just showed his his contempt <laughs> his, his contempt for for oh he views that as it's it's lesser work. I think we found Ayn Rand's grand godfather yeah. right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, apparently uh again while I was doing research online, he he called everyone in for sort of a meeting, I guess, where he stood in front of all of his workers and basically said to them, if you don't like it, leave, you know, and that actually fired everyone up to go on strike. Like that was his attitude. You don't like working here. You don't like what you're getting paid. Leave. And I mean, Walt fancied himself an animator, but you can't animate everything, Walt. If yeah. everybody leaves, then you can say, well, yeah. I can do it. Go ahead, Walt, draw, draw, draw Snow White all by yourself. It's yeah. seven grumpies. Yeah. And so that's, that's why unions are important yeah. to it without uh, having these checks and balances in place. Disney was a tyrant. He was a monster and treated his, his, you know, his valuable employees like garbage. And you have to, you know, hold them to the fire and go, come on. So it's unchecked capitalism. I mean, look, there's no, yes. look, I'm, I'm all yep. for capitalism, but unchecked, it's like cutting the brakes to your car. Like you want to go fast. Great. You want to stop? Nope. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, you chose to get into the car. <laughs> yeah. And then stopping's you, extra. Right. There's a exactly. lot of, there's a lot of gaslighting going on that top down, uh, unfettered capital well no that's the that's yeah. like the whole right the, that's what came after the taft harley act of 1947 that was yes. the whole uh right to work start to pop up because mm -hmm. people said and but like joe like you said if the unions are willing to bail on you and bail on each other how do you tell your membership that hey i got your back when the, when the chips are down and so then people say well if you don't have my chip my back then i'm every man for themselves yeah yeah so um, so unions are important, yeah. but you got to keep the corruption. You got to yes, keep that yes. out of there, which leads me to my next topic. Uh, the 1945 Black Friday oh, clash boy. at uh, the Warner Brothers Gates. Now, this story was really, really complicated. It wasn't just a matter of employees fighting for better working conditions. Apparently, at this time, there were several different unions vying for control of the labor force in Hollywood and these unions were going at it. They right. were uh busting up picket lines and I read things like uh rocks and pipes and I think I read There's the a phrase union called the CSU? battery cables. Yeah, yeah because yeah. they felt that the, they were poaching members from the ITSA, the IATSE. Mm -hmm. And yeah, unions were turning on unions because they felt, hey, didn't you just sell me out? Well, I won't sell you out. So you guys should come join my union. Yeah, yeah. So imagine a competitive atmosphere to come join my union. And the phrase that was going around is, uh, whose side are you on? Yeah. Theirs or mine? <laughs> now, interestingly, the strikers uh, that were involved in this Black Friday clash in 1945 were screen set decorators. Yeah. You know, these, these the, the, you know, when when I did theater, they were called stage rats. They were the people who painted the sets and built the furniture and gathered the props. These were the ones who were fighting for recognition and, and better working condition. And you don't really, you think of the actors, you think of the writers, you don't really think of the set decorators and the painters. Uh, they were affiliated with Painters Local 1421. Uh, so when these important uh, cogs in the Hollywood machine went on strike, 60% of productions were shut down. 12,000 film workers uh, were idle with nothing to do. Um, and the cause was these unions um, going at each other. Uh, the, the union that you were talking about, the International Alliance of Theatrical and yep. Stage Employees, uh, their CEO, <laughs> who was kind of a figurehead more than anything else, uh, was Chicago gangster Willie Bioff, yeah. which uh, yeah. is a funny name because... Uh, Money would go far with this guy. So studios funneled money to him to keep things going on their lots, uh, at their studios. Um, but then in 1941, he was convicted of extortion and sent to Alcatraz. And then in 1955, he, re uh, he was retired. He was living in Phoenix under an assumed name. 
and he went out to his pickup truck, turned the key, and uh, died of an explosion in the car. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that was going on in the Hollywood yeah. unions at the time. And I remember on the podcast where we were talking about the, the mafia influence on um, on Hollywood, uh, I remember talking about Bugsy Siegel yep. uh, tried to strong arm the studios by organizing actors and extras. And he said, if money doesn't flow my way, guess what? My, my organization of actors were going to shut down your production. So he basically strong armed the studios into sending some cash his way. So there's always been that influence, that dark influence. Um, it's happened here in Detroit with Jimmy Hoffa yeah. and all that stuff. Uh, and so there's always that stigma and the unions have to work really, really hard to remind people that it's, it's not organized crime, that they're fighting on the behalf of the workers who otherwise would have to deal with deplorable working conditions and long hours for little pay. So it's a conundrum, you know, it's unions are good, but they've always fell victim to the CD underbelly. Was that in yeah. phase one of our Hollywood crime scene? Expanding <laughs> Which phase are we yeah, in? Shoot, what episode was that? We, did, we touched on the mafia, but you're right. No, like Joe said, if anyone has ever said, I, I enjoy weekends off or religious holidays or paid sick leave. 40-hour work yeah, week. Thank, thank the union. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. That came from unions. So, yep. yeah. Now, wasn't it uh, no Whitmer? Child labor. Michigan's governor um, recently repealed the right to work yep. law. And it was confusing when I saw it at first because when you hear the phrase right to work, it sounds like a good thing. Yeah, everyone has a right to work. But as I read the article and did the research, which I encourage everybody, do your own research. Yes, yes. Um, but basically what the Republicans or the conservatives call right to work was the right – to, to opt less. out of yeah. paying dues to unions, but still enjoy all the benefits, the benefits and of the, the workplace the union conditions. has worked hard to get you. The money. And that is not fair. That's right. not fair. Not so, only that, there's no guarantee that your employer will keep those because there's no union yeah, now. So, yeah. hey, I need you to work the weekends or leave. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, I've had some a-hole bosses who had that exact attitude. If you don't like it, leave. And it's like, well, it's not that easy. It's not that easy to just walk away from a job when you're living paycheck to paycheck. And that's what puts these a-holes in this position of power is they know you can't just walk away from a job and go find another job. Luckily, my previous job, when when things got to that with my boss, who was a dictator, Luckily, I had a job lined up, this job, my current job, nice. which allowed me to give him a big middle finger and tell him exactly what I thought of him. I would have loved, which loved to be a, a fly on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> if you can tell your ex-boss what you really think of him, I highly recommend it. It's, it's, it's cathartic, it's, I imagine. It's enlightening. Yeah, yes, but yes. also you got to think, you know, do I really want to burn this bridge? But in I that guess, case, in that case, yes. I guess it was deserved. <laughs> <laughs> Living the dream, Joe. Living yeah. the dream. Yeah. And not everyone, uh, you know, is in that position. But if, if you can, if you could have something right. lined up and you go out that door, uh, yeah, let let your former employer know why you are leaving. Who knows? Maybe it'll open their eyes. I don't know. No, but I mean, it, you, you, you touch upon it. It's human nature. If there's corruption in union, in unions, then business will take advantage. If it can squeeze another pr more pr productivity at a lower cost, increase profits. That's a corporation's DNA. I have to make money. That's what I am. I have no morals. I don't care for morals. This is what I'm going to do. So then you need a checks and balance. And that's where, Right. Unions come in. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, you know, what were you guys just talking about earlier? Like brakes on cars and things yeah. like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, th I think of like the FDA. Imagine if there wasn't regulation of the food and the products that we put inside our bodies. Oh, you're think talking about a real thing. We don't have that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> think about that I've era the of the like snake oil salesman. You know, the the in the old west, the guy who had, you know, the tonic to cure yeah. all ills. If it wasn't for regulation and oversight, who knows what we would be putting in our bodies? Who knows how long our life and expectancy oh, would yeah. be? It would be 
40 years instead of 78. <laughs> right. or, it's, yeah. But no, that's like every rig, the, the, um, the SEC. Hey, how do you stop Wall Street from doing what it's doing? <laughs> Isn't it, who, who's, who's managing this thing? There? Well, there's no funding to it. It's yeah. like four people. Just like the <laughs> FDA, like one inspector for the state of California. For the state, of, there's one guy, <laughs> one person. What about all those oil rings in the Gulf? Just one inspector. And they get checked once every yeah. seven years. Yeah. Bob, how, how'd, that oil, how'd that oil rig go? It's, it's fine. <laughs> but that's the sad thing about human nature. And I don't know if this applies to everybody, but without those checks and balances, people are at their worst. It brings yeah. out the worst in yes. people. It's, it's, it's one of those things where you, you try, you try not to be more like a, a Puritan or a moralistic, but also say, Hey, you know, we can, we can put things in place where we all will benefit from this. Two very simplistic tests that I always enjoy by the take a penny, leave a penny and one one piece of candy for hollo- for, for trick or treating. <laughs> Go ahead, leave it out there. We'll find out how humanity is. Yeah. <laughs> I often found that there was the kids that are actually more moral. They'll take one piece because they know their fellow kids are going to be there, so they'll take one. But I see the parents grabbing six or seven because then it, they can yeah. get they can bounce out of a uh, they got their quota for trick or treating. Now I I grew up in Hamtramck and I did have a bad experience where. Uh, couple of kids when their parents weren't watching knocked the bowl of candy out of my hand and took every piece <laughs> and i looked at the parents for discipline and they had no idea what was going on and i was done for the night but <laughs> i have seen Sorry, uplifting <laughs> it is, it, it, the way he's, he just put it he just, right? it's so innocently sad and funny at the same time <laughs> like well a, you can't punch a kid it's like a brilliant SNL I, skit every fiber in my body wanted to punch how, these kids how old i were, couldn't do it how old were you about oh i was probably in my early 20s or late okay so so you weren't that, you yeah. weren't at, no 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 you weren't I the same age as initially i thought you were no 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 and you were like, <laughs> I had transitioned from trick or treating to staying at home okay. and giving out candy. Okay, so it might have been my late teens, <laughs> but yeah, uh, that was a that was a valuable lesson. But I have since seen uplifting videos, like on my TikTok feed around Halloween, a kid approached a house that had the take a candy thing right. on the right. thing, and when he approached the bowl, it was empty. So what did he do? He grabbed a handful of his own candy and put it in the bowl and walked away. There and I'm go. like, oh, ah, storing faith in that, humanity there. Uh, yeah. But, this 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 would be a good uh, psych one hundred and one uh, experiment. Absolutely, uh, leave, do it on an actual uh, Halloween night. Have a bowl out in one area, uh, or in one house right next door to a bowl out, a, a bowl of candy to another house. Have one where the people know <laughs> that they're being filmed by. You could have like the little re- ring uh, doorbell, doorbell, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, but the cam, like, yeah. Or something showing that keeping them honest. Some some where the person coming up to get the candy knows that they're being uh, recorded. Yeah. Versus next door, who Not, does it? Yeah. And yeah. see if anyone ta- like acts differently. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, it, it have a, a controlled environment when no one's watching. Right. Would Would you yeah. do the right thing? <laughs> and that's like unions. If no one's watching, would you yeah. do the right thing? Would well, you know that's the interesting do? thing. So without unions. People are at their worst without oversight. So then you bring in unions. But if unions don't have oversight, then they can be at their worst. So yep. that's where, like, the government steps in. So Recently with the UAW, I forgot the guys' names, but they were funneling money. And yeah. uh, they, didn't the Fed seize one of, like, one of their mansions or something? Hmm. So, <laughs> like, there was, like, there was an actual federal confiscation. Yeah, you, you'd have to look up. I forgot the guys' names. Union but. leader, mansion. Bad start to a sentence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you need oversight. Now, I, I was I meant as I was doing research for this particular episode, I, I meant to try and look up some of the Henry Ford accusations. Can you guys recall anything off the top of your head of um how Henry Ford responded to the unionization of auto workers? Um I don't off the top of my head, I, I'll be honest, I, I don't I, know, but I all that I do know is that if this was the same man who said that he believed in paying his workers enough so that they could buy the product that he's making, mm-hmm. that leads me to believe that he'd be, okay, guys, I, I'll pay you. Just don't try to squeeze me too hard. Mm-hmm. Right. And we, we have to talk uh, t- time-wise. Like, are you talking at, before or after he instituted the $5 a day uh, rule? Well, I was just thinking, like, up through, you know, the creation of the Model T and the creation of the assembly line, um, 
I always wondered what the working conditions were like for these workers. And I mean, eventually the auto workers unionized. So you have to imagine that things might not have been ideal right. on the assembly line. Okay. So what would have prompted the auto workers to unionize if, you know, conditions weren't ideal. So I, I Our, hours and, and yeah, labor conditions, you yeah. know, you stick your hand in the, in the, oh, yeah. you know, the factory line, get, lose a hand, get yeah. maimed yeah, by maimed. machinery. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Those, those, those were literal sweatshops. Yeah. If you, if you think about working in Hamtramck in the 1920s in July and one of those El- huge Albert Kahn oh, designed yeah. buildings, what, yeah. you know, what a hundred and, and you know, 10 j- degrees in there and you're, cranking something for yeah. eight to 10, yeah. 12 stamp, hours a day. stamping something. Stamp, yeah. yeah. No, you know, and just as I, that one quote, which he said he want all pays workers enough to, so they can afford it. This is also true. When your picture's hanging in Adolf Hitler's office, that <laughs> <laughs> probably, I mean, I don't want to jump to conclusions. But I'm just saying that's not a good look. Yeah. I do seem to recall reading something about there were, there was such a demand for jobs uh, to manufacture cars here in the Detroit area that if anyone on the line complained or had a grievance, there were crowds of people outside waiting yeah. to get in on there. So if you didn't like it, you were out. They stepped outside and brought the next guy in. So there wasn't a lot of, uh, uh, what's Solidary. the word I'm looking for? There? Yeah, there there wasn't a lot of uh, bartering power that these workers had because there were people waiting outside to take your job it's the it's the concept of i mean the term they they call them scabs and th- they still worry about that today i mean there yeah. it happens all throughout any kind of major industrial strike even now with writers with the writer strike there they say the, the one thing you don't want to be is the person that crosses the line because then you're blacklisted yeah yeah and you know it's funny one of the writers that i follow on tiktok uh he got a question from someone who said uh, i'm planning a trip to la and at part of that trip, I want to like tour the studios, but would that be considered crossing the picket line? And the writer said, yes, but we're writers. We love our fans. We love you. It's not like we're going to come after you because you're on vacation yeah. in LA and yeah. you're touring a studio. But if you want to support writers, then don't, spend money at the studio so i if my i would if i were the writer i would have a similar response but i would say i would say two things yeah go see whatever studio you like see how things get made behind the scenes but also stop by one of our rallies and and see what we're doing too yeah yeah i think that would be a a fair thing that's what i would say i say if it promotes dial if it promotes like you said they know what goes into Oh yeah, you know all these sets wouldn't be possible if someone didn't write the universe into existence. Yeah, yeah, for those yeah. shows. So I wonder if they would uh, embrace me. Like, if let's say I had planned a trip to L.A. this week, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the writer strike happens, and you're like, oh man, if I went out to L.A. and I saw people outside of Paramount or Disney, would they allow me to just walk up, grab a sign, and and march with them? Because yeah. I would in a heart. I, I, I would do that. In a I second. believe I've seen I've seen a lot of photos. Yeah. I haven't seen a lot of video, but I've seen a lot of stills. And it, I I I I recognize a lot of the writers' names because there are a lot, a lot of comedians and people I would know by seeing them. And I'm I'm seeing hundreds and hundreds of people that I don't recognize at all. Yeah. And they said there's only a lot between eleven and twelve thousand people. And that's between East and West Coast. Right, that's right. not just Los Angeles. Right. So there's I, there's a lot of people. I don't think they mind. I think you know there's some people who do it in poor taste. Like if they go there and just try, try to take a selfie, like I was here, <laughs> you're gonna get called out on it. I'm sure. Yeah, like yeah. You're just trying to front. But if, yeah, if, I mean, they're actors that are doing it. They're directors. You know, some some of them wear multiple hats. So yeah, I don't I don't think it'd be anything major. I, I, I well, that's one thing in the history of unions is unions have always supported unions. Yeah. You know, yes. the SAG and Writers Guild supported, you know, UAW and, and back and forth. And and so these actors who, you know, warms my heart to see these actors on the picket line, even though it's a writer's strike, but they're union too. They know what it's like to be a member of a union. And it's really cool to see people supporting the writers. I saw Nev Campbell on the picket line and, you know, of course, Drew Barrymore, you know, stepping down from... Uh, her hosting gig and all that stuff. So it, it, to me, it warms my heart to see actors who could easily keep doing what well, they're doing, one even show, though there's no projects for them to work on. Currently, apparently there's but. one late night show that's 
says, hey, I don't need writers. We're okay. The Greg Gutfeld Show on Fox. I've never heard of that. Yeah, he, the... it, it's hey, Fo- it was hey, Fox. screw you for even bringing that guy up. Hey, I'm just saying, <laughs> it, 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 it was Fox's answer to, at the time, you know, John Stewart, Stephen Colbert. Like, it'll be their late night conservative. Yeah, it, and there's a reason why you haven't heard of it, Joe. It's, yeah. it's exactly what you would think a Fox News comedy show would be. Well, that's what, you know, the, the response to some of these networks who might be against the strike, they're like, that's fine. We're going to go with unscripted shows. But come on, are unscripted shows truly unscripted? Not necessarily. <laughs> there are writers involved there's, in reality shows. There's a lot of gray area with, with reality shows. How, yeah. how dare you, Joe? Unscripted <laughs> shows show the true nature of yeah. humanity and... Touches the drama with the nod. All I, I remember being a, a, a background extra on uh, Gene Simmons' Family Jewels. They filmed an episode at the Magic Stick, is it, uh, in on Detroit, uh, in next to the bowling alley? Yeah. yeah. And um, they they dedicated an episode to a local all-mom rock band called the My Dolls, and a friend of mine was a member of the band, and she said, hey, Gene Simmons is going to be coming to shoot his scenes uh, for our episode, would you like to be part of that? I was like, yes. So I show up at the Magic Stick, and the the moms are playing on stage, and Gene Simmons walks in, and everyone loses their mind. And then there was a there was a, a bar connected uh, to the the area where the band was performing, and they were hand picking extras to populate this bar. And so they picked me, and I go in, and I sit at the bar. And there's a guy sitting next to me, and I turn to my right, and it is Gene Simmons. I couldn't believe it. Wow. And I decided to strike up a conversation with him at the risk of being thrown out of there. And he was very friendly, and we talked about movies and things like that. And so the crew is, like, getting set up, and we're all put in position. And that's when I began to realize, hey, this isn't just kind of happening and being documented. they are they're dictating this whole thing. So they were trying to set up a scene where Gene was left alone with a little kid. And as the parent leaves, the par- the kid was supposed to turn to Gene and say, I got to go potty. And they could not get this kid to say, I got to go potty. And the, the crew is like just begging this kid, just say the damn line, you know, <laughs> and he wouldn't say it. And, I w- I'm so naive. I was stunned. I'm like, this is all scripted. This There's not one impromptu moment uh, in this whole episode. And that's when my eyes were open that, that reality shows are anything but reality. It's all scripted. And so when, when these people say, oh, uh, yeah, this writer strike is happening, but we'll go with unscripted shows, bullshit. Unscripted shows are scripted. Yep. Yep. I mean, it's... It's a gray line which they try to operate and like, well, there's no real dialogue. We just, you know, talk about these topics and say whatever you feel like off the cuff and we'll fix it in post. What? Yeah. That I I've never been a fan really of any type of of those type of shows. I like I like can't, the I like I like the reality shows where there's a lot of there's a lot of physical challenges and danger. So you don't have time <laughs> oh, to play yeah. act of the camera. I'm like So that's the only thing that's scripted is the the talking head. Possibly. Well, no, I mean, look, I was like, right. I, well, I just don't think that yeah, Josh should bite me. I'm like, you better swim, man. It's coming up right behind <laughs> you. Like, I mean, that keep the camera rolling. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I'm hoping that this gets resolved soon. Um, I guess, you know, obviously a lot of the programs that we're watching right now have long since wrapped production. And uh, I don't know when production is supposed to start on new seasons and uh, new episodes, but uh, if for this networks, goes it's on, August. Yeah, yeah. Ne- networks is probably That's when August. going to begin production. Yeah, because then they they do the writing during, yeah, uh, like around right around now May June. Like the showrunners get together, and like hey, we got to think of episodes, and they start writing over the summer. Yeah, so they can start filming to have the pilot ready by September. So I had heard that the strikes that took place in two thousand seven, two thousand eight, lasted around a hundred days. Yeah. And that was yes. sort of a record, I think, at the time. Um, so let's Rook hope it's one forty-six. Go... Is it one forty-six? Back in the day, yeah. Okay, but one hundred, so... yeah, one one hundred will will delay the fall season. Yeah. And... we're at fifteen or sixteen right now days. Yeah, yeah. for this yeah. current one. Um, just a p- quick personal anecdote. My connection, well, my memory of that two thousand seven eight strike was it was season four of The Office, 
and of course that show was it was the hottest show that was the or the hottest comedy at the time right and uh and i was still in college and i wasn't as obviously i was much younger so i didn't know as much about how everything operated and wasn't really paying attention to the strike that was going on and but when it, it affected me when i re, when i heard that oh we were supposed to get 30 episodes of season four, but we're getting, I think, 12. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so that was impacted. And, and and so from that day forward, I'm like, oh, writers are really important because <laughs> oh, sure. my favorite show at the time, I, I got robbed of 18 episodes. Yeah. I mean, of, look, until, of, until it hits home. You know? <laughs> but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, it, you know, that, yeah, that's funny. Uh, most people don't think much about it until they're personally affected. And, you know, that's that's one thing. I kind of want to close on this. We only got a few minutes left. But in general, and I don't want to make blanket statements, but uh, conservatives tend to be anti-union. Uh, unless, liberals unless tend to be. Unless they're cop unions. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> that's a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, liberals tend to support unions, and it kind of falls in line with my theory, and I might get in trouble for saying this. But one of the biggest differences I find between Democrats and Republicans or liberals and conservatives is liberals tend to go – they're motivated by uh, the greater good. How does this affect the greater good, the, the people at large, where conservatives and Republicans – tend to go with how does this affect me personally? And I yeah. think unions reflect that. Unions, for the most part, are about the greater good for all, where those who are opposed to unions are like, this is affecting my pocketbook. This is taking money out of my bank account. And it's like, so I don't know. That's just a yes. conclusion. I mean, that's, I've, I've you think about it a lot, about, when you just talk about the auto industry, a lot of plants were started in the South because they didn't unionize. Oh, you know, yeah. Toyota plants, Honda plants. I mean, that's. All, all the foreign all the foreign plants. Because oh, the, yeah. There's more more cars made uh, in probably in Georgia and Tennessee than in Because the Michigan. Southern states would say, yeah, we're, we're not going to do that to you. We'll deregulate. We'll have it as business friendly as possible, whatever that means. We'll start your workers at 12.50 an hour. Instead of twenty five an hour, the more, up business, in Detroit. The more yeah. business friendly, the less worker friendly. That, that's, a, that's I don't know why that has to be the case. That's but usually that's, the case. Yeah. But now what? Now Joe wasn't wrong about uh, but you know his broad strokes. My problem also is that the intent is there, but then the execution of the Democrats. It's yes. Like, yes. It's like how do you keep fumbling the ball in the one yard <laughs> line, guys? Just oh my god. Well, on that note. Uh, this is a bit of a departure for us, but uh, yes. again, it's very important, and uh, I, for yes. one, support it is. Uh, my writer brethren, and yes. I hope uh, you gain something from this. And yes. There were crimes. We talked about crimes yeah, and yeah. Hollywood. That's right. <laughs> we, we checked the boxes for this this week. <laughs> so good luck to you on the, the uh, picket lines, and yes. thank you guys, and thank our listeners for tuning in on this edition of Hollywood Crime Scene. Good night, everybody. Until next time, Michigan and world. <laughs> and all the ships at sea. And everybody.